Hello everyone and welcome to the next episode of Coteries of New York. Am I right to notice that I feel like the ambient sound in here has changed a little bit? I feel it has a little bit more dynamics to it, like something is going to happen. I feel like we're slowly getting to the very, I don't know, maybe closer to the end of the story and uh, some big things are going to probably happen soon. We'll see. As for now, let's rest. All right, we have plenty of things in here. Faith and myth part three. Benoit believes the time has come for you to meet Father Anthony. The holy man's presence terrifies you, but... This is interesting. I'm not really sure if I should. <laughs> I'm a bit afraid of this thing. What about a nosy reporter part one? Um, no. I'm not starting more quest lines. What about meeting Hope again? Kara wants to meet. Hope decides you should see her alone with an ace up your sleeve. I want to do that. I am very interested in knowing who the hell Kara is after the last meeting with Hope. And I feel like um, we advanced the storyline with Hope um, further enough for us to be able to explore it a little bit more. So as much as the other ones seem to be also interesting, I feel Harris is going to be the most proper to choose. So let's go there. Yep. When you reach the cafe, you're welcomed by the familiar face of the waiter who first led you inside. You exchange looks and nods. He hides his vape pen in the back pocket. She's been expecting you. Something happened to her car and she um, hasn't exactly left her room ever since. He scratches his head, shrugs and gestures at you to follow him. It's the same route as before, first beyond the locked door at the end of the room with all the computers, then into an endless grey labyrinth. Finally, you reach a door that would look like any other to a random bystander. Of course, by now you know that Hope's Haven lies beyond it. The waiter bids you adieu with an exaggerated bow and starts walking back to the cafe. You enter the familiar room, this time the lights are on the inside. Hope is inside, walking around nervously, overseeing every screen in sight. When she spots you, she wastes no time on introductions. Cara Montgomery, what do you know of her? I know the name. You could have seen her in listicles such as Top 5 Badass Women in Tech 2018, 12 CEOs who spark innovation through empathy, or 20 entrepreneurs with mysterious ties to Jeffrey Epstein. You don't get to voice your answer. The question was just a minor courtesy. She has a monologue to deliver and she won't allow any interruption. 20 years ago, she was a failed dot-com investor. Now she's a CEO of Double Spiral, a brand management startup working at the crossroads of big data and influencer culture. The quotation marks are audible, dripping with venom. Long story short, she spent years convincing her Camarilla contacts, as in out-of-touch old farts angry about smartphones. <laughs> A good one that kindred can benefit from controlling the internet oh yeah so this is a new thing for v5 and it's not i would say universal especially when we consider that bloodlines 2 seems to have prince cross as the prince camarilla prince of seattle and he seems to be pretty modern but in general camarilla in the modern times because of the um, insurgence of second inquisition and humanity being such a big risk for, um, for the vampires, they try to diverge from technology a little bit more. The Shreknet, the very elaborate network of uh, Nosferatu that allowed Camarilla people to contact each other, fell after the attack of Second Inquisition. So after this happened, a lot of princes said that technology is forbidden to be used by vampires in their domain and they refuse to use internet smartphones and stuff like that so it depends on the domain again i feel in seattle of bloodlines 2 we will actually have a camarilla prince who will be very much in touch with the modern technology but in general there's a lot of princes out there who are like nope smartphones out just like in schools like bad teachers telling you not to browse your smartphones during the lessons Ugh, horrible her IT ghouls have done a lot of research on deepfakes, AI and machine learning. Her goal is the ability to generate thousands of believably human online accounts. 
basically an army of posters that could brute force anything into the mainstream discourse. The elders took a while to get the concept, but eventually Kara got their blessing. The thing is, she claims her tech is ready to be tested, but it needs one final component to work properly. And that's why... She pauses. She proposed a truce. Truce? What kind of truce? They become my friend or have a violent... Oh, oh, again. They become my friend or face a violent death kind of truce. Not exactly fucking convincing if you ask me. That's Mark David Chapman. I'm, I'm sure it's not David Chapman when I do that, but I'm trying. <laughs> but no matter how much I hate her guts, this is a blessing in disguise. Hear me out. She picked a public place in Manhattan, a neutral ground where we can meet without the fear that the other party might do something stupid and violate the masquerade. She wants to just talk. You will go there in my place and listen to her terms. We won't accept them, of course, especially not after she just tried to kill us. You will just steal her voice and walk away. Steal her voice? What next? Will you trade her mermaid tail for legs? A Disney joke. <laughs> Sweet, what next? Will you pit me with a topical Harry Potter reference? I'm not trying to be obtuse here. Wait a second and let me explain my plan. You see, there is only one way to even the odds. We have to hit Kara where it hurts. And she's only got one weak point. Double spiral headquarters. Kara's the only person there with access to every room. The security is something she came up with herself. Voice based, but based on a different password phrase every time. That means just recording her talking is not enough if we want to get in. That's why I started selling illicit materials to people with access to advanced deepfake audio technology. <laughs> I've got it right in this room, and now all I need is a sample base that will allow me to manufacture a bot that talks like her. To monitor data, I need to stay behind. That's smart! Still, I think the plan is pretty simple. You talk to her while wearing a wire, I process the recordings here to steal her voice, and voila, she's wide open. Then we invade the double spiral and destroy it from within. The evil is defeated, I become a part of your crew. Happy ending for everybody. How does that sound to you? It sounds like you're a part of Mr. Robot, and you know what? I actually love it. I really love Mr. Robot as a series. It's freaking amazing. If you haven't watched it, watch it. It's like, even if you, uh, I don't know, even if you don't agree with the premise, let's say politically, it is just shot in such a beautiful way that you're going to love it. Like, there's no way you aren't going to love it. I'm sorry, I'm rambling, it's a great show, watch it. Let's go. Um, isn't it kind of dangerous? Your Sophie's Langley's right hand, coming to her in peace. She's got no reason to harm you and every reason to avoid pissing off your esteemed patron. Come to think of it, you might be safer alone. That the ghoul that attacked us the last time knew who you were. The only reason you were put in danger was me. Hope shakes her head and claps her hands. When she speaks up, she sounds different. More spaced out, stuttering. Uh, all right, let me fix up y you with the uh, hardware. She hands you a minuscule airpiece and starts attaching a small decorative pin to your clothes, along with some masked wiring. It's a directional microphone. I, I can clean up the audio later, but, but keep it pointed directly at Kara as much as possible. Uh, all right? You put on the earpiece she gave you. It fits snugly deep inside your right ear. One, two, one, two, one, two. The hardware works flawlessly and the audio quality seems great. You give Hope an affirmative sign with your head. Oh, it's a head. Okay. Beautiful. Kara designated the meeting place as the vessel. You've heard about the place, right? It's right by the eastern end of the Lincoln Tunnel. A giant pile of staircases, basically impossible to miss. Manhattan's answer to the Eiffel Tower, or a gaudy monument to being only ever so slightly free, depending on who you ask. I drive you there, but my car is still in the shop, and I don't want to risk being spotted by Kara's people. And I need to process the voice data from here. Which means I have a perfectly acceptable number of excuses for not letting myself get anywhere close to that demonic old hag. You involuntarily roll your eyes a little bit. Hope sits in front of her screens, pretending not to have noticed. 
So, should we get this show on the road or what? Ready whenever you are. No sense lingering here. You get back to the street and find your car. Wrapping up this show as quickly as possible sounds like a good idea. Around 30 minutes later, you are in front of the vessel. Hope's description, a giant pile of staircases, wasn't particularly helpful. From the distance, the building looks more like a giant honeycomb, designed to swarm with tourist bees. At least during the day, that is. At the moment, the place is closed to the general public. A few men who look vaguely threatening and out of place are making sure nobody unwanted gets in. However, you have no problem getting up the stairs. All it takes is an exchange of knowing glances with one of the guards. You are expected. A lone figure appears in your sights, staring down the streets of Manhattan. You know, city people often complain about being unable to see the starry skies, but I always thought the real tragedy was how they're unable to appreciate the man-made sea of lights that uh, surrounds them. I like her shirt. You can teach people a lot of things, but you can't teach them to see, huh? We recognize the face from Hope's phone. Finally, you meet Cara Montgomery in the flesh. She turns to you, puts on a wide smile, and shakes your hand with a firm grip. First, a representative of Sophie Langley, now a representative of Hope. Not the way I develop my own career, but I gotta say, not many neonates get around the way you do. Hardly fucking hard. <laughs> Hope speaks up in your ear for the first time, seething with contempt. Although Kara couldn't possibly have heard her, she immediately goes on to address her absence. Kansu expected her to actually arrive here, with you or instead of you. On the other hand, I'm sure every single word I say will be instantly relayed to her. And for the first time in forever, your empty blabbering will serve an actually useful cause. So let me make sure we cut out everyone but the middleman for a while, okay? She takes out the phone and taps the touchscreen. In a few seconds, the barely perceptible buzzing sound in your ear disappears completely. Shit. Oopsie daisy. <sighs> You can't hear Hope anymore. It's probable she can't hear your voice right now either, which would mean she must be busy raging and cursing out everything in her sight at the moment. This obviously wasn't something she expected to happen. Could it be that Kara saw for her plan? You have to play it cool and see what happens next. Knowing Hope, you've probably heard whatever scraps can be googled about me in a pile of insults for a good measure. Obviously, I know everything there is to be known about you as well, a Lafayette. I don't believe we have a need for, info for formal introductions. But first off, let me apologize for the discomfort my former employee has caused you. I wasn't remotely aware of his planned actions against Hope. I fully condemn them. I'm glad to see you unharmed and, of course, applaud your swift disposal of the psycho. Langley chose you well. Brief silence. Let me cut to the chase here and present myself the best way I know how, through my ideas. Who do you think has a monopoly on reality? Not much for a small talk, is she? Who do you think has a monopoly on reality? Hmm. I mean... If I say we did, that would be really idealistic. We are a Toriator, so we are a bit idealistic, but I would say... Probably we're not as um, stupid. <laughs> the state, you know, it's basically kind of controlled by corporations, if you think about it. We are in states, aren't we? So I would say that corporations, corporations do. That's a fairly typical answer, very 21st century sounding. How have they succeeded in replacing the state here, though? Uh, I mean, it's a political question that you're asking a European. And as a European, I don't feel very much informed to give you a proper answer. <laughs> I would say so, <laughs> but I don't know. She signals to someone behind you. For a while, you've been watched by Kara's men who circle around the staircases, presumably her ghouls. One of them sets off downstairs. You know, Bolivia just had a military coup. Hundreds of new accounts posting about nothing but Bolivian politics in English set out to convince every random person online that the US wasn't to blame. Sloppy work, if you ask me. Now imagine this. A 17-year-old K-pop fan from Ohio writing an entire thread about how her relatives in La Paz are actually glad the president is gone. 
A film reviewer with a side interest in politics selling you a CAI-approved narrative about Evo Morales. An approachable fitness guy explaining the situation to you in simple terms, just like it is. Well, that's a reality. It's big data. <laughs> Animated voice, expressive gestures and steady eye contact. She's taught herself how to project a good image, but isn't there natural yet. At times it feels as if she's screaming at you to trust her. Is a she a brew, huh? I mean, her shirt would say so, I don't know. It's not hard to emulate the masses, reach out to one of those Eastern European troll farms and bang. A few hours later, you have a clone army that will instantly voice their support for any cause. You will spread your message, but you won't foster a new culture that serves your goals. You won't masquerade your messaging as independent thought. For that, you need personalities, not the masses. But the ability to emulate personalities? A whole different ballgame, not a craft, but an art. You need to understand your fabrication so deeply that you start to hate it, and then learn to love it. Is she talking about hope? And if you want to make a bunch of those personalities follow one agenda, you need a once-in-a-lifetime team to achieve that. A like-minded artistic collective, both ambitious and obedient. Even though you can't hear Hope's voice in your ear right now, you could swear you hear her in Kara's speech. It's the exact same tone she was using when monologuing in the car. One of them must have been a big influence on another, or perhaps they used to be in a position where they both shaped each other's personas. Hard to say. Only one thing is for sure. Is Kara Hope's sire? That would be interesting. And that is... Hope must be absolutely furious right now. Is it possible that Kara knew about her plot? Fingers crossed she doesn't. The state is satisfied when an account that what you used for five years suddenly starts yelling imperialist propaganda into the void. The aging corporations are too set in their ways. But imagine a fresh startup that enables the proliferation of ideas adjacent to the prince's plans for the future. Now imagine it getting into bed with the biggest corporations and agencies. So many lives that could be improved or even saved from the rates of first light. I have the infrastructure, I have the elder support. All I need now is a mastermind at the center of it all. Hope. Yes. Hope. She looks down and takes in the scenery below for a while. And then she points at her t-shirt, the one piece of clothing that clashes with the rest of her outfit. You know, I'm a huge fan of punk. The leading idea of my company, Double, Double Spiral, is to make uh, everything I do a little bit punk. I'm all about clashing ideas. I'm all about disruption. Is she a sadite? I mean a minister. Ah, that'd be so cool. You blink a few times in a quick succession. Oh god, you think to yourself, she's that kind of person. You saw a lot of them in your old life. Another rich idiot who thinks deals are an art form, too. Hellbent on perverting the meaning of any piece of actual art that hasn't been thoroughly ruined by the art-hating dystopia that surrounds you. You collect yourself and escape from memory lane. Kara started talking about hope, so you'd better listen. To me, hope is as punk as it gets. A free spirit, fiercely independent, an eternal contrarian at odds with everything and everyone, developing her talent just because she finds it joyful. What god does this girl need guidance? Not putting her talents to better use? Rotting away? Posting inane bullshit all the time? What a waste. I have built an environment specifically to develop her talents and let her become indispensable to our society. But she rejects it because of some idiotic hang-ups. I don't expect you to change your mind about me just because I keep yapping and yapping. I just hope you'll keep my perspective in mind and serve as the voice of reason Hope really needs right now. Now that I've had my say, how about we put our girl back on? She taps on her phone again. A quiet buzz reappears in your right ear. To Kara, you're bluffing. This is a better save than story kind of a thing, isn't it? There's no one listening in. Maybe you're right. Maybe not. She's a hundred years too early to even think of accessing my cops. She's bullshitting you. Don't sell her anything but bullshit in return. Look who's back. Don't worry, she should have heard everything. I just wanted to spare you an annoying commentary track while I introduce myself. Excuse me for a second. One of Kara's guards approaches to show her something on his phone. Hope uses the distraction to get you up to speed with how things are on her side. Um, 
Yeah, for a second there I was about to rage that Hagt has gotten better of us, but hey, go figure, she just wanted to take a piss in my Cheerios. The plan worked! I have a lot of data from her monologuing and um, some private sources, but the more we gather, the better. The display here says some more K letters would be useful. So uh, don't beat yourself up about it if you fail, but if you get her to repeat something with K in it, that might improve our deepfake voice. <laughs> Alright? <laughs> Looks like Kara's done talking to the guard. Sorry about that. Looks like I've got to attend a sudden meeting with a Google representative shortly. That was a K. At least one. Hope snorts. Not bragging, though. <laughs> By the way, does anyone but Hope know about this little rendezvous? Your patron? Any other companion? Or maybe the Nosferatu? Uh, is that her asking? Because it does um... I would say nobody. Nobody. Just us. Should they have told anyone? Maybe. Maybe not. It just says a lot about your personality, that's all. Anyway, no offense, but since Hope's not here, I really have to rush. Honestly, I feel a little insulted that she set this up, uh, this meeting and didn't even bother to show up. Insulted and suspicious, her tone or voice betrays her. She might have some good instincts, too bad she didn't trust them here. Still, out of respect for Langley, I decided to have this talk with you, to explain you why I'm an asset to the Camarilla, and to explain why the Elders need hope by my side. What the worm brain hack here forgot to mention is that the Elders don't give a shit about me! Even if you don't see it my way now, I believe I've sown some seeds that here that might sprout in the near future. Noble Spiral looks out for people who look out for it, is all I'm saying. But before I leave, you know, there's one thing I really wish I knew. Back when I knew her, she was a different person, or different people, depending on how you look at it. Why does she fight against me so much? What's her motivation to resist so much? What's her motivation? Good question. She's never shared it with you. Answer whatever you want, but A, you better lie for your teeth. B, get her to say V a few times if you can. It may improve a few shortcomings of our deepfake software. Hmm, what's your answer? Love? That would be so cute. Um, maybe survival though? Survival. Curse North. Spare me. If you just wanted to keep pulling through, you should have a much better chance by my side. Well, there was one bean there. Pride or spite would be far more believable as an answer. You should have told me you either don't know or don't trust me. Survival. V times two. Good attempt, at least. One of Kara's people erupts with a theatrical cough. Kara gestures at him to calm down. I really need to go now. See you around, Lafayette. She begins to walk down the stairs, surrounded by her guards. When she's gone from before your eyes, Hope decides to summarize her mission. For the love of Christ, wish you could have kept droning her up for a little longer. Turns out the tea letter could use some improvements as well. Not complaining though, you did good, but don't worry, the data I have should be more than enough to generate a convincing deepfake. I just need to put in some more work. So I guess I will get to that right away. Enjoy the rest of your night, drop my hardware at your haven when you get a chance. I'll let you know when we're ready to hit Kara's base of operations. Pray for my success, sweetie, and I might be done soon, maybe even tomorrow. And once we're done with her, we'll talk about how can I repay you for your generosity. Amen! The connection drops. It looks like that's all for now. You gaze at the sea of lights around you for the last time and then start making your way back to the street level. Alrighty. That's fine. Kara seems like an interesting person. I wonder if she's ministry. Like, from sh what she said, she sounded like a ministry character a bit, but also I feel something uh, in between her and Hope. And maybe Hope was actually her child, or is her child, actually. It, it seems to me plausible of an idea that uh, Kara is also a Malkavian, but uh, yeah, no idea. Sounds a bit like um, possibly... A mug. So what are we doing? It's been a while since you heard from D'Angelo. Maybe he's busy sticking his nose where he doesn't belong, or maybe he pissed off the wrong people and is now rolling in ditch somewhere. Either way, now's a good time as any to check up on him. Hmm. 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 There's also Benoit. You know what? 
We went so far with this guy. Also, I'm a little bit afraid that I'm going to die when I meet with him, which is going to be excruciatingly bad because there's no save files in this game. <laughs> but um, I think we should go there. Let's do it. Approaching the cathedral on the street makes you nervous. You've been here twice, and twice something bad has happened, or almost happened, as both cases you run away. Benoit suggested it's time to stop running and experience faith head on. Am I going to die? Because if so, then oh boy. Perhaps he's right. Maybe this covertly to take refuge in rationalizations when you know what you felt. The holiness of the priest and your own damnation. Walking towards the doors of the cathedral, you glance at the bench where you sat when you first met Benoit. He's waiting for you, sitting and contemplating the cathedral's gothic architecture. Hmm. I wasn't certain I, haven't, I even wanted to talk to you after the last time. I understand. I'm happy you chose to come. Benoit looks different than before. Intense. Certain. He wants to kill me, doesn't he? You've had some time to think about what we spoke of before. I'm not sure what to believe. All these stories seem so fantastical. You don't have to believe, you just have to open your heart to the faith Father Antoni represents. Let's go see him. It's best not to talk in the cathedral, so I arranged for us to see him at his home. I have a car nearby. This better be on the level, Benoit. We're beyond that kind of tough talk, don't you think? You follow Benoit as he walks down the street until you come to his car, a surprisingly pedestrian family sedan. The essence of the masquerade is inconspicuousness. Nobody expects a vampire to drive a car like this. Benoit drives north towards Queens. During these moments, you feel almost uh, most anonymous. There's another speck of dust in the vast machine where every action influences the whole in tiny ways. The one thing you've learned about the kindred is that they are not lacking in self-regard. The prince of a Camarilla city is said to rule the domain, yet how much do they really affect mortal affairs? If you ask a vampire, they'll say a lot. Perhaps that's what made Benoit turn inward. The futility of finding meaning in a secret predatory existence. Benoit stops in front of a red brick row house, a little random, but probably not cheap. Benoit notes your interest. Is that the house of the Finbot Primogen? Because it looks the same as the one that we've been to with uh, D'Angelo. Father Anthony comes from an old New York family. He inherited the house. When I first met him, I was suspicious, so I checked up on him. Despite the way he keeps putting you in dangerous situations, kindred paranoia seems to come naturally to Benoit. Perhaps that's something you can learn from him. He knows we're vampires, right? Yes, he knows. What? He doesn't know everything I told you about Cain and the first city and so on. But he knows we're no longer human. Why are we going there? <laughs> Why am I agreeing to this? You follow Benoit to the stairs, looking around for any signs of an ambush. As you get to the door, the first signs of trepidation hit you. The discomfort, the pain that'll follow you once you're inside. It feels like a physical thing, a burning sensation under your skin, in your blood. You look to see how Benoit is taking it. He's smiling, eyes closed for a second before knocking on the door. Almost as if he's enjoying the sensation. Is he a masochist? True faith hurts! The door opens and you see Father Anthony kindly face. Your body feels as if in, in, in a vice. You haven't really been bothered by hot or cold since you were embraced, but now it feels like the surface of your skin is overwhelmed with sensation. The fear and terror are paralyzing. Yes. You barely hear Benoit's whis whisper. Come in, you two. I might not know much, but I know enough not to do this on the porch. You force yourself to follow Father Anthony into the apartment, despite the splitting headache and rising panic. It's hard to take in your surroundings. Everything seems to vibrate, seeking to engulf you. We are walking to the lion's den! Frank portraits on the mantelpiece. Also, True Faith, as far as I remember, uh, I don't remember exactly what were the powers of True Faith in V5, but one of them is actually to... 
um, resist any attempts of uh, mental influence on the human mind from a vampire. So presence and dominate are rendered useless and we are rhetoriators. So this is something that matters a lot to us. Across on the wall, a living room with lots of books, many of them old. I'm not sure I can offer you anything. You don't drink tea, I suppose. No, we don't. We'll be fine. Thank you, Father. Are you sure you're okay? You look distressed. Please, Father. You know this is difficult for us. You'll forgive me if I don't waste time. Father Antonio looks pained, whether because of the rudeness or out of sympathy for your condition. You can't tell. He motions for you to sit down, but you and Benoit are both too agitated to do so. You feel trapped, like a moth being smeared against a burning light bulb. It's hard to look at Father Anthony, but you can't look at anything else either. Benoit is starting to look increasingly unhinged. His eyes look as if he's seeing into some divine beyond just outside the grasp of our senses. Now's the time, my friends. You have to decide if you're ready for salvation. Prove your faith by embracing the Father and let his radi radiance envelop you. What? Please, Benoit, it hurts. You're damned. It's supposed to hurt. Just kneel and be blessed. As the burning pain wrecks your body, Benoit pushes you down to your knees. You don't resist, too consumed by the holy suffering inflicted on you. Startled, Father Anthony takes a step back. Benoit, what are you doing? Father... It's time to be redeemed for both of us. Benoit falls to his knees next to you, lifting his face in full embrace of the holy agony. This is not right, Benoit. Everyone has a chance for salvation. I understand there's something in God's presence that burns you, but you can work through it. Please, Benoit, there are many paths to salvation that will find yours. I won't hurt you and your friends. Benoit moans in pain, stricken with grief and disbelief at Father Antoine's refusal. Did he bring us here to commit a group suicide? Benoit is crazy. Maybe he finds beauty in, in salvation for dying. <laughs> Please, Father, they don't even believe me, not truly. Father Antoine looks at you and seems to waver. Even his belief in salvation has limits. Holy shit. I could kill him. I think. I feel it was a mistake. I knew before it was a mistake, okay? I told you in the previous episode that we are not going here again, but then I did. Because I just like to make myself, my life harder. That's what I do in Vampire and Masquerade. I always go into the lion's den and then I suffer. That's what I do. And I kind of want to suffer more. I want to profess my belief or something like that for more drama. But on the other hand, I'm really afraid of dying in this game because there are no safe files. <laughs> so this is actually making me a little bit iffy. Um, run away. This has gone too long. You must summon the last reserves of your blood and escape. In less time than it takes to blink, you're at the door and outside, using your vampiric speed to escape the pain and fear of Father Antony's holy presence. You're about to stop at the curb, but glancing back, you realize Benoit is right behind you. He also has celerity. The philosophical rueful Benoit is gone. Instead, you see a man twisted by resentment and abandonment, burning with hate towards you. The mask is off, and you realize that he wants you to burn under Father Anthony's touch, even if he has to force you to do it. You're fast enough that the most, for most bystanders you're just a blur, a quick movement that's already gone by the time they start paying attention. Still, running on the street does no favors to the masquerade. There are thousand cameras on the streets of New York, and you run past pedestrians, the odds of someone starting to wander increase. Benoit is past caring. You hear a low growl as he gains on you, fangs out, ready to tear at your neck. You duck into an alley, hoping there's somewhere for you to go. A homeless man stares right at you as you streak past. Benoit can be far behind. It's not very dignified, but beggars can be choosers. You jump into a dumpster and pull the lid closed. You lie still in the stench of the garbage. In moments like these, you're grateful for not having to breathe. 
Is Benoit still outside? Did he fall for it? You wait for what seems like an eternity before you cautiously lift the lid of the dumpster, just the alley. Benoit is nowhere inside. You escaped. You're safe. But the implications of your experience are troubling. What does this mean? Whether practical or spiritual, it feels like you have to think about this for a long time. You're free to return to your haven and there is a distinct temptation to keep the events of the night to yourself. Yet these events can't be good for the masquerades. Talk to Sophie. You make your way to Sophie's apartment seeking comfort in the anonymity of the crowds on the New York sidewalks. Some are coming from a late shift at work, others are going out. You nod at the doorman and slip into Sophie's building, go up and knock on her door. Sophie opens the door in the middle of a phone call. She motions you to come in as she mumbles assent to the phone. She could be talking about earth-shattering secrets or an acquisition from an art gallery. Following Sophie's cue, you sit down in the living room. A few moments later, Sophie ends her call and sits down the opposite of you, regarding you with her usual mix of paternalism and disdain. You appear shaken up. That's not a good look to cultivate in the world of the kindred. Tell her about Benoit. I have to tell you something about Benoit, your child. Benoit. I haven't heard from him in a while. Why did you dig him up? Benoit is talking to mortals about us. You have to ask Kadir to put him down. Oh, I mean, yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Sophie looks at you with such anger for a moment you're afraid she'll slap you. The moment passes as soon as it came. She looks lonely for a moment before speaking. I suppose you're right. That's how we deal with wayward childer. I'll have a talk with Kadir about Benoit. Let's keep your name out of this. Poor Benoit. He never did come to grips with his nature. You leave Sophie's apartment unsure whether you did the right thing. I saved my ass, okay? That's the right thing in the world of darkness. I kind of like, I understand Benoit, I understand, he's kind of like Ash Reavers, but more of a, can God please forgive me kind of a way, uh, this kind of a toriator that um, is a little bit too emotional about this whole embrace thing to, for his own good, and instead of um, like just following the whole toriator's path of using his curse, against the others, against the humans, and just, you know, to corrupt the others. He corrupts himself with that agony and the pain and the angst um, in a Verter kind of a way. I think, like, Goth as Verter is a very good uh, concept for a Torator, like this forever suffering um, person who tries to, like, be some kind of a martyr because it's apparently beautiful. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's Benoit, and that's sad, but I want to save my own ass. I am in the world of darkness, and unfortunately, the world is not forgiving. So let's do that. Despite everything, Benoit showed you something that's impossible to dismiss. In the coming nights, you'll have to decide what it means. If faith is real, what is the role of a vampire? Which myths can you build your life on? Perhaps one day, you'll find your way back to Father Anthony's door. Hm. That was interesting. This little, little tidbit of a faith thing. I'm not really sure how it would end. I would really love to have a save file and check it out. Um, I feel like we'll have to replay this game afterwards and see what would happen if I actually agreed to be blessed by Father Anthony. Would I actually receive some big damage or would I die? I don't know. You come back to your haven after a long night out. Right before you open the door, you notice something strange. The sounds of television are coming from your apartment. Mad Men, if you're not mistaken. Very good show. Go watch it. Very good. You open the door and carefully peek in. A young, disheveled woman is curled up on your sofa. She has a blanket pulled on top of her and seems very comfortable. Next to her lies an obviously unconscious preppy woman. Oh, you're home! It's my stalker? The woman reaches for the remote and puts Mad Men on pause. You weren't home, sister, without you. You know, Netflix and chill. Join me, there's a space in the sofa. I brought us a snack. You didn't enjoy the one I gave you before, but this is a different type. The woman points lazily to the unconscious girl. Oh, I forgot. My name is Adelaide, Adelaide Davis. I like you a lot. Help yourself and settle in. Getting opportunity, Netflix and chill. <laughs> What does let her down gently mean? Would that mean like 
telling her gently to to go away and we can <laughs> I mean, I'm tempted to do Netflix and chill, but she's a stalker and she's in my house and she broke in, so that's not really nice. Thank you for all you've done for me. Still, the sun is coming up soon. You don't want to get caught here. Oh, that's so sweet. I don't mind. I can spend the day with you. We should go on a proper date first. Oh, that's nice. I like that. Adelaide bounces up, clearly caught up in the idea. The door to your apartment opens, someone with a key, Sophie. Adelaide Davis, the curse of the snack harbor in the flesh. This is a new low for you, fledgling. Adelaide looks at Sophie murderously before fading from view. I hate it when they disappear. They should have enough manners to slink away in embarrassment so we can all enjoy it. Sophie waits for Adelaide's shape to leave the apartment before she speaks. The clan of the moon. They not advise caution when dealing with them? As you watch, Sophie makes a phone call. Ten minutes later, two of her servants arrive to remove the unconscious girl sprawled on your sofa. You clearly need my help. It won't happen tonight, but let me see if I can resolve your stalker problem for real. We have to wonder what Sophie meant by that as she leaves your haven. Can I ask more about this girl? She seems interesting. Hello? Ah, okay. That's fine. Oh, new things. Somebody's watching me part free. You've had enough of Adelaide Davis. It's time to head for Elysium and confront her with Sophie by your side. But I don't know her much and she tried to help me before. I don't want to like totally say that I had enough of her. I just didn't like her breaking into my place. That's all. And you know what? I'm going there. Let's check it out. Visiting Elysium with Sophie is always a humbling experience. She's connected, well-known, important, you're a nobody. <laughs> You've always known this, of course, but it's especially apparent when you arrive with her. Everyone notices her and she drinks it in like it's her birthright. That's Adelaide Davis. Let's go say hello. You spot the woman Sophie's referring to. Adelaide, your stalker. Intense, disheveled, young-looking, a Malkavian, if you've understood correctly. As you approach, Adelaide smiles at you, with a darting look of distaste towards Sophie. No, don't worry, I don't judge people by the company they keep. That's sweet of you, darling. Let me say this straight, you can't keep doing what you've been doing. You have to leave my poor world alone. Adelaide looks from Sophie to you and giggles. The sound must be rare in Elysium because it makes people glance towards you. <laughs> I know she's making you do this. Don't worry, we'll be together again later. I'm not ready for a romantic relationship with you, Adelaide. Let's stay friends instead. That's fine, don't worry, we can stay friends. Friends who kiss and watch Mad Men together. Mm. Please, I'm not ready for romance. I can respect that. I'll be delicate with you. What's wrong with her? What is happening? I can wait, we are immortals. The years pass, but the feelings we have for each other are precious. What is the origins of her love to me? I want an, I have questions. This is very sudden, okay? Have I missed an event in there? You should know that I'll always be there somewhere. Invisible in the night. Savi so chuckles as Adelaide walks away. I suppose that went as well as could be expected. It seems you have a garden angel. Have fun. Okay. I mean, that's cool. Maybe she will come to my help later on. As Sophie steps away to chat with her friends, you feel lonely. Surrounded by kindred, you're not sure anyone can really help you navigate this bizarre social environment. Give me deer. Give me deer. Ah, No deer for me? That's fine. You and Help set out to destroy Kara Montgomery's company from within. Or we also have uh, these guys. I feel like Hope would be a good choice for the next. So we can continue out with her. The stalker thing was very sad. And what do you guys think about that? Because that was... I mean, stalkers are pretty sad. And actually, they are... Um, yeah. Developing emotions without you actually knowing that they are doing so. So I guess it's, uh, it's a thing. And <laughs> it would be understandable. But uh, yeah, that was interesting. Anyway... 
I would go and meet with Hope next time, most probably. If you guys have another idea, let me know. And I feel like I will wrap it up right now because we've been uh, through uh, plenty of events and I don't want to push it too far to make sure that we are not going to end up with a big cliffhanger. Anyway, I'm going to see you guys in the next episode of Coteries of New York. Thank you so much for joining me and see you in another one. Goodbye. Don't get lost in the night. <laughs>